Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Don, thank you so much for making time to sit down today. Um, I've heard a lot about you over the past couple of years from our mutual friend, Lane Norton, who suggested that you know we sit down and go even deeper down this nutrition pathway. Uh, what you may not know about me is nutrition is my least favorite subject, but I think I, I say that only because I, I, I'm so tired of sort of the uh, religious aspect of nutrition. Um, so I'm, I enjoy talking about nutrition through the lens of biochemistry, but thereafter, my, my patience for it has, has dwindled over the past decade. So uh, I have a feeling we'll get along just fine because your entire background <laughs> is based on nutritional biochemistry as opposed to nutrition religion. Um, but Well, first of all, it's great to uh, meet you, Peter, and uh, even electronically. And, and uh, my, my interest was a little sort of the opposite. I was interested in biochemistry first and studying organic chemistry just seemed so boring and esoteric that nutrition, I could actually apply my biochemistry to things people were interested in. So I kind of like that split, but I, I totally get your aspect of the zealot ends of the spectrum. <laughs> did, you, did you know, you grew up on a farm, if I'm not mistaken, correct, in Illinois? Yes, that's correct. And uh, before we started recording this, you mentioned to me that your parents, your dad lived to 97, your mom to 102. So you're, you're at the midpoint of your life right now, essentially based on your good <laughs> genes. Um, but what was it like growing up on a farm, you know, 70 years ago? It was a great experience. Um, you know, back in the fifties when I was born, uh, agriculture was very poor in the United States. And so you sort of grew up in that background. But I think some of the things I learned was I learned about animal growth. I learned about reproduction. I learned about growing corn and soybeans. I learned about life cycle. And I just got an interest in food. Uh, you know, we were, we were growing it. We were had it there on the farm. And, and so it just made me interested in it. And then you know, combined with that, I always had an interest in science and sort of evolved to be a kind of a natural marriage, I guess. So when you're going to college, did you study biochemistry and organic chemistry first? That was your undergrad? Yeah, the, the, the background, the serendipity of how I got into nutrition, it certainly wasn't anything I knew about. I was in a small town, uh, went to a school that had like 400 people in it. And, and so it certainly wasn't anything I knew about, but I knew I liked science. So I went to first uh, Illinois State University to study chemistry. And I pretty quickly realized I had no aptitude for inorganic chemistry, but I sort of understood biochemistry pretty well. Uh, I got to the end of it and it was actually during the Vietnam War. Uh, and I was scheduled to go into the military uh, and so I was totally unemployable and the university said, hey, you're doing really good at this chemistry stuff. We'll give you a graduate assistantship and you go when you go. And all of a sudden I ended up with a deferment getting a master's degree in biochemistry. <laughs> and my mentor at that time said, you really have a knack for this nutrition part of it. Why don't you do a PhD? And I sort of said, oh, really? <laughs> and so I ended up at University of Minnesota doing a PhD in nutritional biochemistry and fell in love with all of it. So it certainly was no grand plan, but it kind of fit my background of agriculture, food, sports nutrition. I fell into a group that was doing muscle metabolism and it just kind of all fell together for me. Now, was Ansel Keys at the University of Minnesota at that time? He was not. He had left, but his legacy was there with George Blackburn uh, and uh, Ivan France and some of those individuals. So I certainly got that background while I was there and, and certainly invested a lot of how my early thinking of nutrition. And, you know, I think Lane Norton, who you've talked with before, is, uh, has talked about how our thinking of nutrition evolves. My certainly has evolved. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about what, at least as far as you can remember, what was your what was your underlying philosophy of nutrition circa, you know, 1975, you know, which is probably when you were doing your PhD, I'm guessing? Yeah, I I think sort of one of my earliest 
sort of thinking about nutrition. Again, it sort of dates to my interest in animal growth, and but also sports nutrition. Um, I very early developed the philosophy that nutrition was really about two tissues, two tissues, the brain and skeletal muscle. If those two tissues were healthy, you were gonna live a pretty good life. Everything else is regulatory, the liver, the heart, uh, the kidney, the gut, everything else adapts to your environment, but you have to focus on those two. And I think if you tailor your nutritional requirements around that thinking, you end up with a much more sensible approach. And I, I sort of coined the concept that uh, my colleague, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and I always use a muscle-centric nutrition. Mm. Uh, and you know, if you keep muscle healthy, you've got a good shot at avoiding obesity, avoiding diabetes, avoiding cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's go into that a little bit. I mean, I want to get into some weeds on a whole bunch of other really nuanced sure. stuff, but let's let's <laughs> let's follow this thread for a moment. So, when you say that, I assume you're at least in part referring to the the following two facts: one, muscle is the largest sink for glucose. Uh, so, you know, 75 to 80% of our glucose storage capacity exists within skeletal muscle. And then there's another factor of muscle, which is it's a very early depot for excess adipose tissue. So once we start to let little droplets of fat accumulate within muscle cells, it leads to this process of insulin resistance that then creates a problem for the first point that I made, which is you now make it harder for your carbohydrate storage unit to accept carbohydrates. And of course, that leads to hyperglycemia and ultimately diabetes. Is that part of why uh, that formulated your thesis or is there more to it? More to it, I, I, I mean, I think what you stated is, is correct, but I do think about it differently. Mm -hmm. I think about um, muscle really serves two functions. One, the obvious one is mobility. Uh, most people, uh, get to the age of 65, uh, beyond that, most people actually die from some form of immobility, falls, breaking something, hospitalization. So functional mobility is critical. But the other aspect is metabolism. And muscle is a primary site for insulin activity. Uh, you mentioned glucose storage. Uh, I look at it more as an issue of glucose utilization uh, uh, and also fat utilization. So basically your blood glucose and your blood lipids are heavily, I mean, obviously the amount you eat makes a difference, but the actual level is heavily dependent on your muscle metabolism. And you sort of commented about insulin resistance being associated with fat, actually insulin causes insulin resistance. So if you chronically elevate insulin too long, uh, that is the definition of type 2 diabetes, is that basically insulin causes insulin resistance. Well, say, say more about that. I mean, I, it, it's hard to untangle some of the causality here, right? I mean, uh, you know, yeah, I sure. spoke with Jerry Shulman, God, probably it's been two years ago. And, you know, in, in his paradigm, right, you have the accumulation of diacylglycerides within the actual uh, myocyte. So not in, not not interstitially, right, or not between them, but it's the it's the actual accumulation of lipid within. And it's funny, I'm blanking on which enzyme now that inhibits, but it's basically down the PI3K pathway, the PI3 kinase pathway, right. where you basically render the muscle cell less sensitive to the signal of insulin telling the GLUT4 transporter to come up. And so yeah. th this hyperinsulinemia is is effectively the first way that you can externally measure insulin resistance. Is that sort of in line with what you're saying? Yes and no. So um, Jerry Solomon's great. Uh, I definitely followed his research a, a lot. Um, and the, the thing to understand about the biochemistry is you can create the models to give you a negative feedback. So he's absolutely correct that um, that uh, diacylglycerol or ceramides will feed back to the insulin receptor, the GLUT4 transport and the insulin receptor and cause insulin resistance. Uh, so that's, 
That's true. So that that is a philosophy of fat centric, mm. that fat causes all the problems. On the other hand, you can do the exact same thing with glucose. Too much glucose will also inhibit the insulin receptor uh, and cause that same exact feedback. It doesn't accumulate the ceramides or the, uh, the diacylglycerol. I did some research with diacylglycerol and if you sort of do it in the, in the issues of high carb, low carb, you won't find those effects. Mm. So the question then becomes, which one's more likely to be physiological? Mm. Because people are eating um, 350 grams of carbs per day or because they're eating 90 grams of fat per day, which one's likely to cause it? Uh, Bob Wolf, there's a th philosophy called the Randall Hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of it, yep. but it basically the philosophy is, uh, the Randall Hypothesis was that fatty acids, the diacylglycerol, cause all the problems. And what Bob Wolf did was basically run that experiment with say, stable isotopes, and he showed it's actually the reverse, that fatty acids are not inherently toxic, but glucose is. It has its own disease, we call it diabetes. And so when you eat excess carbs, you ha must get rid of them. You absolutely have to dispose of them in the next two hours, or fat basically can hang around for much longer. It's just simply not that toxic to the body. In fact, the body, the, the body always wants a certain level of free fatty acids in the blood because that's the fuel for the heart. Okay, so it's always high. Now, what, what so about the idea that the excess- basically the issue is the balance. Yeah, what, what about, sorry. yeah, sorry, what about the um, ability that that excess, the, the ability to turn that excess glucose into fatty acid via de novo lipogenesis? Are you saying that that doesn't happen quickly enough to alleviate some of the toxicity of a, acute hyperglycemia? It doesn't happen super quick. I mean, that's a great question. Uh, there's a lot of people who argue how much de novo lipogenesis actually occurs, but basically when you get into requiring high amounts of de novo lipogenesis, now we start talking about fatty liver. Mm -hmm. And so now you start seeing triglyceride problems. And so people who are actually doing a lot of de novo lipogenesis typically have elevated triglycerides. So that's one of the first signs that you're dis disrupting that flow. Triglycerides in general are there to recycle uh, free fatty acids. So the, the, blood's all, the, the adipose is always dumping free fatty acids out for the, for the heart and other tissues. The problem comes in is when you start blending that with too many carbs and too many fats. So, you know, first and foremost, calories are always the problem, but when you have excess calories and then you start rebalancing these macronutrients is when you get into trouble. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I'm, you're obviously intimately familiar with this, maybe even some of the listeners are, but there's a very famous paper by Mark Hellerstein, you know, kind of circa yes. mid 90s, 94, 95, that demonstrated really a very small amount of de novo lipogenesis taking place with carbohydrate feeding. Um, I absolutely believe the results of the, that paper uh, but I also think it's a very narrow context, and it's not necessarily the context of an overfed individual. And uh, therefore, I think our capacity for de novo lipogenesis depends heavily on total energy content or total energy balance. And therefore, I think there is a scenario where in the Hellerstein paper, you can feed a high carbohydrate diet, but within the overall composition of a low energy diet or a balanced energy diet, and DNL is actually quite low. Uh, conversely, you can feed, you know, a high carbohydrate diet in the context of a high energy diet. And I think we would probably see a much greater amount of DNL. Um, yeah, totally. And, and so, yeah, I, so, I, think, I think the context yeah, you're, matters. You're exactly and and right. I do think that the first, if, if we were describing this as a polynomial, right, like the first order term is energy. The first order term yeah. is how many calories are coming in. Uh, and, and, right. and, and that probably matters more than the ratio of carb yeah. to fat. Yeah, go back to that that Randall hypothesis or Wolf discussion. Um, you you always want to think about it as that carbohydrates, glucose, excess glucose is toxic. If the blood level is high, you'll damage basically every tissue from your eyes to your toes. Yep. <laughs> and so you have to dispose of the glucose. So Hellerstein's what he showed was that 
If you have a diet that say, say the American diet, 50% carbs, 35% fat, and you take in a um, 1,000 calorie meal uh, or 800 calorie meal, which one are you gonna put into fat quickest? You're gonna put in the easiest one, the one that's already fat. Yep. And so the carbohydrate's gonna get burned and the fat's gonna go to fat. It's just simply the body is selecting the easiest pathway. But if you switch that, and Jules Hirsch did it, and then, and then Jeff Volek did it later, if you switch that to a 80% carb, 10%, then you'll see that de novo liposynthesis. And one of the interesting things out of it is when the body makes fat, the only thing it can make is saturated fat. Yeah, so we have a lot of saturated fat in the blood that actually doesn't come from eating fat, it comes from eating carbs. Yeah, again, in the context of how much we're eating, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, so taking it back. It's important to realize, it's important for people to realize we burn around 100 calories per hour. That would be 2,400 calories per day. So 100 calories per hour, uh, in a two-hour period, you're only burning 200 calories. So everything else has to be stored. Average American meal is 400 to 1,000 calories. That means you have to store all of that. Yeah, interesting. I, is that an argument, you think, for spreading out calories more over the course of the day? That takes us into a protein discussion, and I would say absolutely not. <laughs> um, the mm. two, two angles to that. One was there was a theory back when I was early in my career, back in the mid-80s by Gil Lavelle, and he was arguing that lots of small meals was good for uh, less fat deposition. And it was an artifact of how he did the study. We ran, he did it with animals and basically showed that when you made the adaptation to lots of small meals, uh, the animals didn't gain as much as if you uh, adapted them to like two meals per day. But the artifact was when you adapt an animal to two meals per day, they go through a starvation period because they'd have to learn to do it. And when you come out of a starvation period, you're making more fat. Mm. So we redid it with a longer adaptation period. And what we found was that um, reducing the number of meals per day actually is thermogenically advantageous. You actually waste more calories. So we actually redid that and published it. The other aspect we can get into is protein. Protein needs to be distributed at specific meals. The distribution needs to be high and eating lots of small meals uh, is a really bad choice for a lot of reasons. And we can get into that, but anyway. Well, I, yeah, and I definitely wanna get into that because if there's, if there's <laughs> one area I really wanna double click on today, it's everything from protein timing protein type, animal right. versus plant, protein yeah. efficiency, amino acid variability, all that kind of stuff. We're going we're gonna to go deep on that. But let's go pick it up back in University of Minnesota. You've got the legacy. And I'm guessing at the time, you know, Keyes is really famous for two things in the mid-70s, right? I think by that point, he's probably already published his seven-country study. And the, right. the hypothesis now is a very fat-centric view of, you know, the, the negative consequences of dietary fat, specifically dietary saturated fat in the American diet, especially as it pertains to ASCVD. And then I suspect the second thing that he's probably still famous for is the starvation experiments um, that were, I'm guessing, done in the 1950s. I mean, these were done on conscientious objectors, so they're probably in the 40s or 50s, right? Yeah, I, I can't exactly date that, but you're exactly right. So those were, I mean, we learned a lot about starvation at that point <laughs> for obvious reasons we can't do experiments like that before but we learned a lot about body composition and how the body starves so those were good but certainly the legacy was there and when i got to minnesota you know i sort of bought into the cholesterol and the saturated fat and total fat and you know i i sort of okay this is what everybody's teaching and you know that's what they, i was forced to learn that's what they were teaching uh and so i bought into it but you know, as I slowly started doing experiments and early in my career, we did a lot of fasting type of experiments with animals to look at composition changes. And I did malnutrition work in, in Northern Africa. And I sort of got into all of that. And I, I, I started realizing, you know, I don't really believe that. And 
One seminar I will always remember at Minnesota was an individual by the name of Fred Kumaro came to Minnesota and gave a seminar about the dangers of cooking oils and specifically trans fats. Mm. And Blackburn and France just ridiculed him, basically said, this is the craziest thing we've ever heard. All these plant oils are great. Uh, and basically, you know, 20 years later, we banned trans fats from foods literally as the most dangerous fat that you can encounter. So I, I always remember that just sort of thinking, wow, you know, people who ha have bought into this dogma aren't necessarily right. And we need to keep questioning it. <laughs> Speaking of friends, um, obviously in 1973, he completes a study, the Minnesota coronary experiment. Um, I, I actually find this to be one of the most difficult studies to interpret, not so much the one that he published 16 years later, by the way, in 1989, yeah. but the one that yeah. Chris Ramsden republished just a couple of years ago based on all of the data from Franz's study, plus data he never published. This, to me, is one of the most complicated stories. And I, I will tell you, I have posed this question to every friend of mine who is more steeped in nutrition than I am. And um, I still don't have a great sense of how to explain these results. So I'll explain it for the, for the listener and the viewer, and I'm curious to your thoughts. So the experiment was done um, in basically institutionalized patients. So again, maybe not a study that could be done easily again today for ethical reasons, but had the advantage of being so well controlled. You, you basically had patients that were randomized into two groups. Their total energy was identical. Their total split of macronutrients was identical. The only thing that differed was that in one group, it was high saturated fat. And in the other group, it was high polyunsaturated fat. The hypothesis being tested was, is saturated fat intake leading to increased major adverse cardiac events, heart attacks, and strokes? The experiment that completed in, I think it ran, I, I can't remember exactly, I think, I think it ran about five years, in 1973 showed no difference. There was no difference in cardiac events, despite the fact that the group that was on the higher polyunsaturated fat group did indeed have much lower cholesterol levels. Now this was this predated the subfractionation, so they weren't measuring LDL and HDL. They were just measuring total cholesterol. And at the time, there was some correlation between cardiovascular disease and total cholesterol levels. At the extremes, that was certainly true. Again, because I didn't think we'd be talking about this, I don't have the numbers all in my mind, but we'll link to it all. <laughs> Directionally, I believe that the higher PUFA group relative to the saturated fat group was about 30 milligrams per deciliter lower in total cholesterol. And based on everything we know today, we would assume that much of that was in LDL cholesterol indeed being lower and non-HDL cholesterol. And yet there was no difference in events. And of course, it's become a very famous and unfortunate story in nutrition research and that Franz chose not to publish it because he didn't like the results. It didn't match his hypothesis, which was that the group on lower saturated fat would have fewer events. Ramsden went and published all of these data, plus a whole bunch of sub data, as I said, just a few years ago, I believe in the British Medical Journal, and actually found something that was, that threw a wrench in my initial hypothesis. My initial view of the Minnesota coronary experiment was, it probably wasn't a long enough intervention. It might be that five years was not long enough to appreciate a difference. And so it was underpowered or too short in a duration to see a benefit if there was a benefit. But in Ramsden's analysis, you actually saw the opposite because he now looked at some subgroups and you actually saw a higher incidence of coronary events in some of the people that were consuming the high polyunsaturated fat diet. And I can't remember what the dominant oil was. I'm blanking on it. I don't remember if it was canola or safflower. I think it was safflower. So how much of that do you remember, Don, from your time there? And can you, can you shed any light on this? Or do you have any thoughts on, you know, how to interpret that experiment? Well, first of all, I am definitely not a lipid expert. So, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I sort of remember the study, but I can't put any more numbers to it than you did. I actually did some research with Ivan France and 
Penny Chris Etherton when I was at Minnesota. So I, you know, I sort of was in the loop at the time, but that's been a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I think if one really looks at the literature on saturated fat and is fair about all of those studies, you find a very mixed bag. You, the Women's Health Initiative and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and unfortunately, the people who believe the hypothesis have either delayed publishing it or said, well, it couldn't have been wrong and tried to, you know, it could have been wrong and they tried to find all kinds of excuses as opposed to just believing it. Uh, you know, there's an old theory in science that, you know, if the theory is correct, it'll get stronger over time. And if it's not, it gets weaker. And I think one would have to realize that, A, the cholesterol theory, the total cholesterol theory has definitely gotten weaker. And the saturated fat hasn't held up very well. Um, you know, we still believe it, but your comment a little bit ago, it's first and foremost calories. If you put excess saturated fat on top of too many calories, that's probably a problem. But if you're at or below your calorie needs, I don't see any data that suggests it is. So, you know, my sort of joke or comment all the time is that if you're committed to being obese, you probably ought to pay attention to the quality of your fats. But if your goal, if your goal is to be lean and healthy, calories is what you're paying attention to and the macro distribution is sort of your personal preference. So let's talk a little bit now about how your interest in protein came about because, you know, of all macronutrients, this is the one I have to pay the most attention to. Um, and it's honestly the one where I feel like I fall the shortest. You know, I, I feel like I have some days when I nail it and I have too many days when I come up short. I never go overboard. <laughs> I never go to bed at night thinking, God, I ate too much protein today. But I do go to bed sometimes thinking I don't think I ate enough um, for my goals, yeah. right? My goals are to sort of maximize muscle protein synthesis. My goals are to preserve lean tissue as long as I can. And frankly, that's the goal for my patients. So um, how, did, how did this become a, a strong interest of yours? Well, the real interest started in my master's degree because I got interested in studying protein turnover, protein synthesis. And I was working with Arlen Richardson, who was an expert in aging, and we were studying age-related changes in protein synthesis. And we actually discovered uh, the changes in mRNA over time, that the poly A tails on mRNA get shorter, uh, your ability to put ribosomes on the message goes down, and you have lower synthesis. So that efficiency of change of protein synthesis over time is a theme that runs through all of my research, and we'll get into efficiency in adults and things like that. So that was sort of the beginning. When I went to Minnesota, then I sort of got a muscle focus on it. And, and one of the first things I learned in graduate school is we don't really have a protein requirement. We have a requirement for nine essential amino acids and organic nitrogen, organic amines, which all translates into the fact that we can make 11 of, of amino acids and nine we have to have in the diet. And one of my favorite uh, quips I use when I'm talking to groups on stage is that, you know, protein we should think of as a vitamin pill. We don't have a daily requirement for a vitamin pill. We have a requirement for 12 vitamins inside the pill. We don't actually have a daily requirement for protein. We have a requirement for nine or 20 amino acids inside of it. And so talking about a protein requirement just reflects ignorance. We have a specific requirements for nine essential amino acids. And that gets into the complexity then, because these amino acids are essential for building blocks for new protein, but every one of them has a metabolic role, like leucine and mTOR, or arginine and nitric oxide, or lysine and carnitine, or cysteine and glutathione. And all of those roles are vastly above the minimum that is detected for nitrogen balance for the RDA. And so that's where people fall apart is that we, we think about vitamin C and we know there's a minimum RDA to prevent scurvy, but people will take five or 10 times that during COVID for immune response. But we resist thinking that way about amino acids and it's exactly the same. 
You know, that's a great point, Don. Maybe we should spend a minute helping people understand what an amino acid is because, you know, I took biochemistry. I have my little cue cards. I can draw every one of the amino acids. Not anymore, by the way. I yeah, I was going to say, not anymore. <laughs> yeah. but, but there was a day when I could draw all nine of them. But, but let's help people yeah. understand. I think most people understand what glucose looks like. If you've listened to this podcast, you're no stranger to the idea that glucose is a six carbon ring. And each one has a couple hydrogens on them, and one of them's got an oxygen and a hydrogen on it as well. I think most people who have listened to this podcast have a decent sense of what a fatty acid looks like. Long stretch of carbons. If it's saturated, there's no double bonds, so it's just littered with either two or three hydrogens, depending on where it sits in the chain. And then, of course, you store them by putting three of those onto a nice little three-carbon glycerol backbone. But I actually think most people, uh, understandably, have less clarity around what an amino acid is. And you've already alluded to the fact that there were 20 of them, and nine of them we can't even make. I mean, we're, if we were deprived of these things, we'd be dead. So we got to eat them. But um, can you give folks a sense of the nomenclature? What, what, what is an amino acid? What do these things look like? Yeah, so... Um... A little bit like a fatty acid, uh, an amino acid has a carboxy end uh, connected with a carbon, and then it has a nitrogen end. And when the body is making, so when we eat protein, we get these amino acids in some sort of a string, but we totally digest them down to probably individual amino acids, maybe di or tripeptides, and we absorb them that way. They get to the blood. Uh, as single amino acids for the most part. And then the body begins to reconnect them based like uh, on the messenger RNAs, our DNA tells us how to reconnect them. And so we connect a carbon to a nitrogen and we string them together. Of these 20 amino acids though, they all have that, car that acid and nitrogen part, but they also have a side chain ranging from very simple one like glycine with just a hydrogen to ones like tryptophan that have a big aromatic part to them. And so all of these are different and they go into proteins in different structures. The, the DNA tells us how we put them together and proteins can be simple like insulin with 51 amino acids or they could be like myosin with thousands. Uh, and so they're also, and then every protein in the body has a different turnover rate. Some of them like insulin might last 15 minutes and some of them like myosin, or we'll just take collagen, might last 250 days. <laughs> and so they turn over at different rates. So that's sort of what they are. Um, but beyond that building block structure, then every amino acid has other kinds of structures. Uh, it might be like lysine, where part of it becomes the molecule known as uh, uh, car uh, carnitine, which is for fatty acid metabolism, or it might be the nitrogen off, off uh, arginine that goes to nitric oxide for vasorestriction, or it might be cysteine, which goes to part of, of creatinine or glutathione. So we can get the leucine, which is sort of my favorite, which is a signal uh, which really got me interested in protein and metabolism, is a signal for muscle protein synthesis. So again, they all, have this building block structure. They get strung together uh, in different links, uh, but they also have other metabolic functions. And that's what people don't recognize when they're talking about protein requirements. So let's talk about that RDA, right? Because <clears throat> when we look at our patients and evaluate them from a nutritional standpoint, um, almost without exception, we come to the conclusion that they are not getting enough amino acids based on how much protein they're consuming. Now, I don't know how much of that is the nature by which food is prepared these days, the nature by which, you know, protein makes up a certain amount of the caloric uh, uh, intake based on various types of, you know, prepared foods and things like that. And how much of that just based, is based on a belief system of what people need perhaps coming back to the RDA. So um, how, how, what, so first of all, let's tell people what the actual RDA is and, and how it came to be. 
So the RDA is a recommended dietary allowance. So it's, some people think it's daily, but it's a dietary allowance. So it's sort of a generic number. And the argument is that for all RDAs, uh, we sort of test a population and come up with an average number. And then for a safety factor, which average would be 50% would be deficient. And so we add a safety factor of two standard deviations, which supposedly 97.5% of the people would be adequate to prevent any, any signs of inadequacy at that point. But that also means 2.5% of the people are actually deficient at that point. <laughs> so that, that's sort of the definition. Um, where does the RD come from? I think it's useful to go back in history just a little bit then on protein. Um, how did we begin to evaluate protein needs? Well, it all came out of animal sciences. Uh, back in the early 1900s, before we even knew the essential, all the essential amino acids, uh, farmers were trying to say, how do I get animals to grow best, you know, and different kinds of proteins and things like that. And they developed protein quality scores and things like that. So uh, how much growth did I get for what I fed? Uh, how much nitrogen did I deposit for how much I fed? So these were all rapidly growing animals and we developed this concept really of nitrogen retention. Um, that basically, uh, we've now translated into what's called nitrogen balance. And that's how we determine the protein requirement. Basically, what's important in all of that discussion, that long-winded explanation is that all of the concepts were developed for growth where nitrogen balance was positive. You could measure a change over time. And as we've now tried to start applying that to non-growing adults, it gets a lot more vague. Um, so it's important to recognize that what we think about protein requirements is A, developed from nitrogen balance, where you measure all of the nitrogen you're eating, which you can do pretty good, but then you have to measure all of the nitrogen you're losing, which we're really bad at. <laughs> and we call that nitrogen balance. Can you explain how that's done, Don? That's, this is, I think we're gonna talk so much about it that I, I think it's, it's worth getting into the details of how nitrogen balance is calculated. And let's do it in a human. Yeah. So if, if I came yeah. into your so, lab, yeah. how would you do this? Uh -huh. so, so let's start with the front end. Let's start with nitrogen in. So that's basically, you just take a, a bunch of food and you do a an chemical analysis and you measure the nitrogen and you multiply it by a factor of 6.25. So A, you're measuring nitrogen. It's not really protein. It could be nucleic acids. It could be anything with nitrogen. You're calling it protein. And then you're multiplying it by 6.25, which says, I believe that protein contains 16% nitrogen, which also isn't always true. So now we've got this error on the front end. <laughs> and now on the back end, we're going to try and measure losses. So the primary loss of, of nitrogen in the body is in the urine, urea. So that's pretty easy to measure, you can collect that. Second would be the stool, uh, so you can collect that. But then you get into things like sweat and skin loss and hair loss and respiratory nitrogen, ammonia in the breath, and those are all incredibly vague. So everyone who knows nitrogen balance says that nitrogen balance underestimates requirement everybody uniformly <laughs> but that is where the rda comes from and it, it when you do short-term studies what you find is most people young adult and again all these studies were done with college age students so they're kind of right at the end of their growth uh and basically in a short-term seven-day study they look okay so that's sort of where we're at uh, in the last 20 years, those of us who study protein have gone beyond that and said, well, nitrogen balance is one outcome, but it, like the vitamin C argument, there are other outcomes based on amino acid metabolism that may be more important than minimum nitrogen balance. And, and we now know that protein handling goes down, the efficiency goes down as we get older. So now we have much higher requirements that we, that most of us talk about for adults. So just to be clear, Don, going back to something you said, the reason we all agree that that standard nitrogen balance underestimates the requirement is it's easier to measure the sum of the ins than the sum of the outs. 
Yeah, exactly. And 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 the chances are you're significantly underestimating the outs. Yeah, especially if you do. I mean, when I was a surgical resident, there were times we did nitrogen balance on patients who were on long-term TPN, total parenteral nutrition, in the ICU. These were patients that um, it wasn't clear how long it would take for their guts to start working again. So they had to be fed all of their nutrition through a central line, which is very complicated feeding to do. Yeah. And when we would have the nutrition team come and do a consult and do a nitrogen balance, I mean, they literally had to put a tent over that patient. To, right. uh, that was, you know, they were doing the best that they could in the ICU to basically create a laboratory environment to calculate yeah. nitrogen balance, which turns out, as you're not surprised, very important for a critically ill patient. Right. I mean, right. that is a hyper, hyper catabolic state. And if you're trying to create an anabolic state in that person to keep them alive, it's imperative that you understand how much nitrogen they have uh, yeah. or how much nitrogen that yeah. they require. So um, the, the simple idea of I'm just going to tell you how much protein you're eating and I'm going to measure the nitrogen in that's coming out in your urea. That's that's just not going to cut it. That's just too simple. Yeah. And currently, a lot of those studies are simply done with a factor. So they don't put them in tents yeah. or buildings or whatever. They just measure urea in the urine and everything else is just sort it's of- It's like 1.3 well, we of it's a one point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so obviously, we're perpetuating an error based on ignorance. Yeah. So then let's go one step further, Don. Um, how do you use isotopes to now really get- into what's happening, not just on the boundaries, but like how that nitrogen, and, and by the way, I think there's one point we should make for the listener who might be still lost as to why we're talking about nitrogen. Proteins <laughs> have nitrogen. Amino acids all have yeah. nitrogen. Carbs and fats don't. So this is where we, we can really speak to the source of the nitrogen, right? And now, as you mentioned, anything with a nucleic acid is going to have nitrogen as well, the majority of the nucleic acids come in proteins. Come in uh, would be found in the foods. Yeah, front would be found in protein-based foods. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, car I mean, fats and for the most part, annoying essential fatty acids, carbs and fats are basically energy sources. They're carbon-carbon bonds that provide energy, where amino acids have a very different purpose and structure, and that nitrogen is part of what makes them different. Yeah. In other words, <clears throat> we consume carbohydrates virtually exclusively for their energy content, fat mostly for its energy content. There is some structural in importance that comes with fat and cholesterol. Um, but really, you don't want to be consuming protein for energy. Right. I mean, you know, the only caveat I would say to that is that um, there might be reasons that people are uh, hypersensitive to carbohydrates where uh, taking in more protein beyond what you might actually need for protein metabolism might be a substitution for carb calories. Um, and we can get into that conversion and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I talk with people and they say, how well, how much protein, what's your high end? And I sort of give them one number and I say, but you know, the caveat is you might want to take more if you're really trying to struggle with a carbohydrate issue. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but you're right. <laughs> so now let's talk about that measurement of what's actually happening with those amino acids. Actually, only, this question I want to ask you even before that. Let's think about the normal, when people think of protein, they think of meat, right? That's going to be a great source of protein. Obviously, there's mo there's protein in most foods have some protein in them, but um, if you if you're eating a, a piece of steak, how many of those twenty amino acids are in there? Are they virtually all in there? If you're looking at animal source proteins, whether it's meat or eggs or milk, uh, basically all of the amino acids that a human would need are in those because they're basically you know, obviously a 
chicken's not a mammal, but the others are mammals. And basically we have the same amino acids, the same proteins. So they're, they're all there. Uh, meat is a good example because they're all pretty much in the right balances. But every protein has a little different balance of essential amino acids. Um, you know, you can look at dairy proteins and dairy proteins are something we can fractionate because they're all water soluble. So we know a lot about alpha lactalbumin versus lactoferrin and lactoglobulin, et cetera, et cetera. So we know that, you know, a lot of differences about amino acid compositions of individual proteins. And so going back to what you just said, then animal protein, we typically think of as sort of meat mammals, right? You know, beef pig, stuff like that. And then of course you've got sort of bird protein, mostly chicken for folks, and then fish protein. And then you have eggs, dairy. We're yeah. saying basically- So other the first three, yeah. the first three are exactly the same for a protein. Okay. So whether it comes from a cow or a pig or a chicken or a fish, muscle protein is still muscle protein. And how do we think objectively about the quality of a protein. This is a topic that uh, you, you've you've talked about extensively, but but and, and there's a there's a there's a way there's a numerical way to talk about that, isn't there? An efficiency of of that protein versus you know tofu versus you know soybean yeah. versus rice, you know that all the way down yeah. to sort of lower and lower protein density foods. Yeah, protein quality is something that I think a lot about, and I'm actually w working with a group now to sort of reinvent how we think about that. But I think you're referring to protein quality in the sense of PD-CAS or diaz or something like that. Basically, we realize that when you look at a protein, there are two, there are two factors. One is what's the composition of the, those nine essential amino acids, and the other is What's its bioavailability? How well do we digest it and absorb it? Um, with animal proteins uh, and most isolated proteins, you know, even uh, soy protein isolates, uh, the digestion absorption is pretty close to 100. It's usually 95% or higher uh, for all animal proteins. For plant proteins, though, it gets into, uh, you, you need to realize that in a plant, the, the protein is there for the purpose of the plant. <laughs> and so a lot of it is attached to fibers, to structures. You know, we have, the plants have proteins attached to the leaves and the stems and the roots and the flowers and, and uh, the seeds. And it, you know, when you start to isolate that, uh, if you just eat it in a raw form, uh, it may only be 60, 70% available uh, because we can't digest the fiber. So those are the two factors. We can put those two together and get a protein quality score, and we can uh, determine that a whey protein isolate, because of its essential amino acids, is 20% better than a soy protein isolate, just because of the amino acids. Or we can compare uh, a wheat protein, uh, you know, a, a wheat bran, and we realize that it's only 40% available. You know, so if you look at wheat bran on a cereal box and say it was a wheat flour, uh, and it says there's four grams per serving, there's actually less than two that you can actually absorb. And so, you know, that, that's how we look at it. Um, in my opinion, uh, the, some of the problems with those right now is it's hard to compare across foods and it's hard to build a meal that way. We can say that whey is better than soy, and so if you're only eating those two things, that's okay. But what happens when you start putting them together? And so we, I am working on a group with a group trying to build a protein quality score that really based on three amino acids, uh, lysine, methionine, and leucine, which in my opinion are the key markers for adult health. Uh, and so we're trying to rescore it differently, but you know that again, long-winded story about protein quality, but that's how it's measured. No, that's, that's very interesting, Don. So what you're saying is, if I'm understanding you correctly, you could brute force your way through life by looking at every single thing you eat and trying to figure out the dias score for its protein. So, okay, I'm about to have a ribeye. That's going to be about a 96% dias. Uh, I'm going to have my, you know, soybeans over here. That's about an 80% dias. I'm going to have my whey isolate. That's 100% dias. 
I'm going to have my shredded wheat. That's a 40% dye ass. That's a tough way to go through life because you yeah, can't just and, add and up the they're not truly additive. Yeah. yeah, they're not truly additive. You can't really figure that That's out. Right. And, the, and the average person doesn't even have that data. I mean, if you go into the USDA database with whatever, 7,000 foods, uh, there are 4,000 that actually have amino acid scores. And of those, there's probably less than 300 that have diaz scores. And so you can't put it together. Uh, there's no way. And so we're trying to develop a system that allows people to get better than that. If you, if you look on a label on a package and you see, again, a wheat cereal that says it has four grams of protein, well, again, that's a nitrogen analysis times 6.25 for all the problems I've said. And then if you look over in another column, it'll say daily values. Yeah, exactly. And there almost no almost no label have daily values for protein because they don't that would require a PDCAS or diaz score and nobody has them. And so that four grams really would translate into less than two, but nobody's being told that. That's right. And, and by the way, just for folks uh, who are hearing us use the term diaz, that's digestible, indispensable amino acid score, correct? Yeah. Right. Right. Okay, so and I have a big problem. The, the the digestibility is where a lot of people have been focusing, but I have a big problem with the amino acid scores because they're incredibly low. They're way too low, and so we have they're established by the World Health Organization by the FAO, which is really designed to prevent malnutrition in Africa, where we know from our Institute of Medicine that the essential amino acid scores are much higher than that should be. Uh, you mentioned stable isotopes a little bit ago or tracers. We know from stable isotope studies that all those FA, FAO amino acid scores are too low. And so that's part of the equation that we're not telling people either. I want to come right back to that, but I'll finish this one point, which is what, what you're offering is an alternative to people living in spreadsheets to calculate how much actual indispensable amino acid they're getting is, hey, what if we make this easier and you focus on the actual content of three amino acids? So we're going to take a subset of essential amino acids. And if I recall, I remember leucine was clearly one of them. Lysine was one of them. Was methionine the other one? M Methionine's the yeah. other one, yeah. So we're going to take methionine, leucine, lysine. And we just want you, Peter, to walk around and make sure you get enough of those with each meal and if you do that, the rest will take care of itself. Is that effectively what you're saying? That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. If you look at diaz scores right now, um, the amino acid scoring, A, I've already said is too low. But if you look at how they're scored, they're not scoring apples and apples. They're scoring apples and oranges. So if you look at the soy deficiency, all, all legumes like soy or pea are limiting or deficient in methionine. And you score that against whey, what you end up is the limiting amino acid in whey is considered histidine. Mm. And no one has ever shown histidine to actually be a limiting amino acid in an adult. It's a limiting amino acid in children and babies, but nobody, so now we're comparing apples and oranges. They're not fair. So if you compare methionine to methionine, it's not 20% higher, it's 250% better in soy, comparing soy, soy and way. Yep. So, so we, we need to compare apples and apples. We need to compare them across the three essential amino acids that are actually likely to be limiting. Where histidine, phenylalanine, to my knowledge, no one has ever shown those to be limiting in an adult. So why do we consider them limiting? All right. So you've already mentioned the importance of leucine and, and listeners of this podcast are no stranger to leucine because you know, we've had David Sabatini on, we've had Matt Caberline on. I mean, we've gone deep in the weeds on mTOR. And in fact, it was one of David's postdocs that actually discovered the leucine sensor on mTOR. So we know yep. now pretty unambiguously, leucine is an amazing trigger for mTOR. Of course, there's going to be a subset of people listening to this who are confused. But wait a minute, Peter, if rapamycin is good and rapamycin inhibits mTOR, how can leucine be good if leucine turns it on? And of course, they're forgetting the chronicity of the state. Sometimes you need mTOR off. Sometimes you want mTOR off. Uh, sometimes you want it on. Sometimes you want it off. But when we're talking about eating, we want it on, right? We want to be able to turn mTOR on for muscle protein synthesis, right? 
So let's circle back to our earlier com comment about how often you eat. Yep. Uh, so now we've got an issue of mTOR and whether it needs to cycle on and mm -hmm. off. And not only does leucine turn it on, but so does insulin. Yep. And so probably the worst case scenario, and you can use a lot of animal studies to back this up, would be people who eat a lot of small carbohydrate meals that continuously activate mTOR. Uh, what we want to do is use specific meals with the right amount of insulin to activate muscle-centric uh, mTOR. mTOR is in every tissue, and what you don't want to do is continuously activate it in liver or some other tissue. And so that's where the confusion gets into Absolutely. it, is people ignore the fact that insulin is just the biggest trigger in other tissues, where leucine is a very unique trigger in muscle. Yep. Um... So now let, let's go back to the practical application of this. So we talk, So we know why leucine matters. Can you say a bit more about methionine and lysine and why um, using, you know, raising them to the level of, of, um, of, of leucine becomes a great proxy for overall protein load? So if you look at, if you look at limiting amino acids actually in food, lysine is always limiting in grains and that has been shown in animal science over the years. That's a, that's a major limitation in how you feed, what the minimum amount. Uh, so that one is probably limiting for protein synthesis. Uh, it's also in carnitine and some other things, but lysine is probably mostly for protein synthesis. Methionine is one of the least, uh, so if we look at the amounts we need, uh, we need about 3.4 grams of lysine per day. We need probably a little less than one gram of methionine. Hmm. So they're not in the same proportion either. Uh, but the methionine is what we call part of the one carbon pool. And so basically for the body to make and repair DNA, to make and repair RNA, to make taurine downstream, to make the non-essential amino acid cysteine, to make glutathione the oxidant, methionine's the key to all of those pathways. And so uh, we methionine is one of the most limiting, and it's limiting in all legumes. So we think of soy and pea and a lot of, you know, and, and lentils and things of that nature as higher quality protein. They are, but they're still limiting in methionine. What are some of the natural sources of food the, that, are, that are high in methionine? The classic one of, quote, sulfur amino acids is eggs. Eggs, yeah. That's my... Eggs are, are quite high in the sulfur amino acids, which are methionine cysteine, and cysteine. You know. uh, but all animal products are, are adequate in them. Um, and, and basically all plant pro products are pretty low in them. So Don, how, you know, you grew up on a farm, right? So you, yes. you know, we look at animals like cows, which are quite muscular, yeah. eating yep. basically just hay and grass. For right. them to be able to be as catabolic as they are and produce so much muscle, does that just speak to the incredible volume of that plant that they have to chew to make sure they're getting enough methionine enough lysine and enough leucine? I think you meant anabolic, not Yeah, catabolic. sorry, sorry, anabolic, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in, yeah. in such an anabolic um, state, I mean, what volume yeah. of total protein in the form of grass and hay and things like that do they need to get a sufficient amount of those muscle-building amino acids? That sort of wanders us into a sustainability argument, which I really love to w wade into, but cattle, ruminant animals, are a very important part of the food chain because of their stomach, which is full of bacteria. One of the things to think about for, for um, essential amino acids is really the only place they come from in life is bacteria. Hmm. Nothing else can make them. Uh, and so our primary source of them in nature is the bacteria on roots of plants. So the bacteria on the roots will take the nitrogen. Why do we fertilize our garden is nitrogen. The, the bacteria will take that inorganic nitrogen and form organic amines with it. But, and those organic amines then can be made into, plant, into proteins in the plants. But as I said earlier, 
The problem with plants is that they don't have the same balance as we need. They have the plants to make roots and tree, you know, limbs and roots and flowers and things like that. The beauty of a ruminant is they can take that plant and they can digest it and the bacteria then will rebalance all of the amino acids. They'll capture inorganic nitrogen and they make the essential amino acids that mammals need and they concentrate it for us. So basically humans, one of the arguments is humans evolved by being able to use more concentrated protein. You know, if we just ate, you know, if we just ate plants, it's hard to get enough. But if uh, you know, the ruminant animal can actually digest all of that, form it into it, into, uh, into uh, appropriate amino acids. So basically for, for every 60 grams of, of protein an animal eat, they'll make 100 grams of, of essential amino acid, you know, balanced protein. Wait a minute, so say, they're say basically that again. Upside. So, yeah, say that so again. For, for, so for every 60 grams of plant-based proteins uh, and nitrogen that they'll take in, they can upcycle that to 100 grams of amino acid balanced protein. So ruminants are called upcyclers. So whether it's in dairy or meats or you know also you know goats and and sheep and 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 deer, all of those ruminant animals upcycle by eating grasses. They produce great quality protein. No other animal, no other animal can do that. And just to make sure I understand the mass balance of that, the bacteria are obviously the engine of that upcycle. You can't yeah. make nitrogen out of nothing. So you're saying the right. other four- But they're making, they're making protein out of nitrogen. That's right, that's what I was gonna say. So they're, so they're getting the nitrogen yeah. so, from the fertilizer that went into exactly. the grass and- Not quite, they're getting nitrogen that's inorganic in the plants, but it's not actually in protein forms. Yep. Okay. And so it's in the fibers and other kinds of things. So they're able to upcycle that. They're able to increase the value of non- amino acid nitrogen, plus they capture all of those other nitrogens. So first of all, that's fin fin I, I, I had no idea that was happening. I had I had never heard of that phenomenon. So that's incredibly fascinating. Um, secondly, um, are they also disproportionately creating amino acids that weren't necessarily there in the plant? So in other words, if you use the example you gave earlier, yes. which is, you know, you eat 100 grams of cow protein, you're going to probably get quite an amount of methionine, lysine, and leucine. Is it true exactly. that that amount of amino acid was not even present in the 60 grams of grass protein that they consumed? Exactly. That's exactly what's happening. So the, the bacteria, if you look at the flora uh, in the cow, they have certain bacteria that will produce methionine or lysine. So they can basically take a non, you know, an amine nitrogen, or they can take glycine, a non-essential amino acid, and they can make it into uh, into uh, amino acids. One of the one of the supplements that you can actually feed a cow is urea. So a, a human waste product type of thing. We we excrete nitrogen waste as urea in the urine. Uh, you can actually feed urea, a, a nitrogen source to a cow, and they can make it into methionine or leucine or lysine. <laughs> Unbelievable. So the it's an interesting argument because you you know this gets now we're not now we're now we're venturing from nutrition into religion, but right because th <laughs> yeah. there's certainly a group of people who would argue <laughs> sure. that we should not be eating any animal protein whatsoever. We shouldn't sure. eat you know we shouldn't eat meat. We shouldn't eat sure. eggs. We shouldn't eat dairy, etc. Um, a counter argument to that would be it's awfully difficult without these animals to get adequate amino acids, especially if you stop thinking of it in terms of an RDA and start thinking of it in terms of essential amino acids. I try and stay away from the religious argument of it. That's a that's a you know that's a personal preference. As you say, I grew up on a farm where we raised cattle and pigs. We raised corn and soybeans, and so you know I saw it as a life cycle type of thing. Uh, I think of it as a biochemist, uh, and there's just no question that ruminant animals play a very important role in our food system, and one we can't really replace. Uh, we can't just idle 
millions of acres of grassland and pretend that we can grow avocados on them or broccoli. Uh, you know, cattle uh, basically spend a year of their life on basically nothing but grass. Uh, and that is an amazing, you know, and that's an, and sheep are, you know, sheep and goats the same, but those are amazing contributions to our food system. Yeah. I, again, I, I was completely unaware of this capacity to concentrate and, you know, almost up produce, um, yep. both in yep. quantity and quality of amino acid. That's, that's a very yeah, interesting exactly. finding. Um, so where were we before we went down that path? Because I was just trying to understand how it happened. So, so also didn't appreciate the role of the bacteria. Um, I think we were about to get into, oh, I know where we can go back to. You mentioned that you have spent some time studying the difference between, call it 20-year-olds and 60-year-olds in terms of the efficiency of muscle protein synthesis. So... And this is where you probably have to get into the isotopes, right? Now you're getting into sort of nuanced yeah. stuff. But what do we know about a 20-year-old versus a 60-year-old who's under, uh, who puts their muscle under a progressive overload? So they're they're now asking, you know, they're 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 doing resistance training. Um, they're being provided with adequate amino acids, and let's assume they're being provided with not just the right uh, quantity but the right quality of amino acid. Um, what do we know about the assimilation of that amino acid into new muscle tissue across, and, and you pick any age you want. I, I just use 20 and 60, but I, I know you've studied this at very specific age points. Piece of background before we get into that is important to recognize that whether you're 16 or 65, your body needs to make nearly 300 grams of new protein per day. So there's a protein turnover. Every, every tissue in the body is turning over. Uh, some as fast as liver enzymes where you replace every hour, muscle proteins where you replace with half-lives of around 15 to 16 days, so every 30 days. Collagen turns over at about half-life of 100 days, which is why if you hurt your knee, it takes so long to repair it. But basically, if you put that into thinking, the body replaces literally every protein in it about four times a year. That's a pretty remarkable number. Uh, and then if you think of, we have to make 300 grams of new protein per day, the average American intake is around 80 grams or less, women 70, men 90. Um, that means that there's a recycling thing going on. So of every new protein that's getting made in the body, about six out of seven amino acids are getting recycled. All of that sort of feeds into this process of protein synthesis, protein turnover. And what, remember I said what I was doing with my master's degree, we were studying the age-related changes. What we now know is that as you get older, the efficiency of that protein turnover goes down. So where a 16-year-old, uh, you give them a certain amount of protein, they'll have a very good response. A 65-year-old will have maybe no response at all, or you know, 10% or something. But what we have learned, sort of with the study of leucine and initiation factors and all of that, is that if you give an enriched source of essential amino acids, more protein, uh, you can actually make the adult look just like the 16-year-old. So what we know is that the efficiency goes down, but the capacity to respond doesn't. And so what we're now thinking is that, what we now know is that if you have a requirement that's about twice the minimum RDA, so instead of 0.8, it's 1.6 grams per kg, uh, we can get the adult, the 65-year-old, to respond just the same as the 20-year-old as far as muscle protein synthesis. Now, you know, a moment ago, Don, we talked about how it's a slippery slope if you just focus on total protein. So when you say 1.6 grams, per kilogram, does this assume it's from a whey-like product and an animal-based product? And if, if that person says, hey, I'm 65 years old and I'm on a plant-based diet, are you going to say that number is going to need to be higher? So uh, that's a great question, a great way to ask it. Um, what we know 
is that most people who go to a plant-based diet, a vegetarian diet, decrease both the quantity and the quality. So your point is exactly right. If you're on a plant-based diet, you'll need more protein, and that means you'll have to have more calories. Um, but what's the threshold for that? What we would probably argue is that if you have 100, 120 grams of protein per day, it probably doesn't matter the distribution between animal and plant because you probably have enough to cover it, okay? Uh, if you're only eating 50 grams of protein per day, then it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. You'll never catch up to your essential amino acid needs. So somewhere between 50 and 120, it depends on what you choose. You know, so, you know, if you're going to be plant-based, you know, have 125 grams of protein per day and you're probably fine. But if you're going to be vegetarian and you think you're going to get along with 56 grams per day, you're going to get in trouble. Going back to this difference earlier about the, you know, call it anabolic resistance, right? Between the 65-year-old yep. and the 16-year-old. The obvious thing that comes to mind is there's a huge difference in androgen level between those two. Right. What are the other things that might explain this anabolic resistance that I think, by the way, I think it's very interesting that you can overcome that by a higher amount of protein. But prior to that workaround, what else do you think explains anabolic resistance? Clearly, the hormone issues are, are, are first and foremost. So, you know, I, I'm, I always make the comment that uh, when you're growing, hormones are your friend. They're sort of driving it. And you look at malnutrition in Africa and children will grow on really lousy diets. They may not grow as healthy, they may not live as long, but there's a survival reproduction nature to that. Um, now we switch to talking about healthy aging and I want to live to where my parents, you know, <laughs> I want to get to that century mark. Now we talk about healthy aging and now we sort of change the uh, we change the criteria that we're looking for. Um, let's just think about mTOR for a second and try and put that in framework. Uh, there are four different signals that regulate mTOR. Uh, we've mentioned leucine. We also mentioned insulin. Uh, 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 an enzyme, uh, a factor known as AMP kinase, which is carbohydrate sense, is energy sensitive. And then another molecule known as RED1, which is stress sensitive, uh, particularly resistance exercise. So there are four different things the, the individual balances. When you're young and growing, insulin and IGF-1 dominates that. And insulin, first and foremost, is a growth hormone. And when you stop growing at 25, it ceases to have an effect on protein synthesis and muscle. And so now the shift, the whole thing shifts to protein quality. Protein quality is not nearly as important when the system's dominated by hormones. And so now what we know is as we get older, we can buffer that loss of the hormones by higher quality protein, mostly leucine, and resistance exercise. Those two factors will balance out the growth issue that young people have, the benefit of the growth part. So that's a, the way you, you have to think about the change in efficiency with aging. Speaking of aging, at the front end of what you just said, I want to I want to go into that a little bit more. And um, I think most people will recognize that this is an enormous problem in the developed world, and we should talk about it through that lens because I think that's where it's most stark. But I'm curious as to whether or not you think this could become a problem or even plays a role in childhood obesity rates. So let's talk about what happens to a child that is protein deficient at the beginning of their life. What, what is the implication of that later in life? So when I got into protein, um, uh, John Waterlow and Joel Milward and Peter Garlick and Vernon Young were sort of the godfathers out there that I learned from. Uh, and I got involved with some international malnutrition with the U.S. International Agency for International Development, USAID project in Morocco. And so we looked at that and that, that led us to doing some animal studies. And basically, we look, used the animals to look at malnutrition and recovery. And what we found was that malnutrition, starvation insults early in life 
would stunt muscle development, basically limited the DNA development, limited the cellular development, and basically stunted lean mass in, in the children and in the animals. And if that was stunted, basically uh, what happened is the, the, ind the individual as an adult was always predestined to have low lean body mass and high body fat, yeah. obesity. And that was really the origins of how we started thinking about uh, muscle-centric health. If muscle didn't develop right, if it wasn't metabolically correct, you were predestined to some of these other things. And, and I mentioned Gabrielle, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and I. that's sort of how we put that concept together is muscle-centric health, we've got to have the correct development and we have to have the correct protection as adults because that's kind of where both your mobility and your metabolic health start. Don, what's the mechanism? Do we, we have a sense of why, you know, for example, maybe, maybe people are aware of this, but when you look at children in places like Africa who are really malnourished, um, at first glance, you almost pause and think, well, why are their bellies so big if they're malnourished, right? Well, you know, and yet they don't realize that's an actual, that's an extreme, and I don't even remember, what, it was Kwashiorkor, was that the name of the? Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah, and what's the exactly. pathophysiology of that? Why is the extreme malnourishment lead to that protruded yeah. abdomen and things like that? So there's sort of two function, two terms, two directions that childhood malnutrition goes. One is called marasmus, yep. which is sort of the skin and bones look, and the other is Kwashiorkor, which is that kind of a, a inflated belly looking. Um, the, 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 belief, the belief of those two differences is that in Kwashiorkor, there's disproportionately poor protein, mm -hmm. and that leads to changes in water balance and edema. Uh, people have argued, is it cortisol-based, you know, is it stress-based? But it, it appears to be an imbalance in the protein-to-energy relationship, where in uh, marasmus, they're just short of total calories and total protein and everything. Mm -hmm. But in, in, yeah. in, uh, uh, in Kwashiorkor, it appears that the quality of the protein, they're eating these starchy porridges and things like that, totally deficient, probably in lysine and methionine, uh, and that leads to water imbalances and other things. And what is it about this critical window of development where this protein deficiency makes it very difficult for them to put on lean mass later in life and creates a propensity for adiposity? So again, we actually did some of that original research uh, and this was stuff we did way back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, muscle, muscle is a very unique cell structure. We have what are called muscle fibers. And unlike a liver cell, which has a, a DNA, a nucleus in each cell, muscle cells are multinucleated. They have what are called satellite cells around them. And so as the original fiber begins to develop, the satellite cells will put DNA, these nuclei, into it. And what we determined was that each DNA has a certain amount of protein it can handle. And so what the DNA ultimately determines how big your muscle can get. And so what we determined was that late in pregnancy, early in lactation, if the insult occurs during that, you stunt these satellite cells and you don't develop enough DNA, so the muscle is always limited in its potential size. Wow. Um, I was aware of the propensity for adiposity later, was not aware of the, uh, the limitation in lean growth. So this is really the double whammy, right? It, you, it's effectively lifetime right. sarcobesity. Yeah, so, so basically you're decreasing your lean mass, you're decreasing your metabolically active tissue, uh, and, and, and so you're sort of stuck with minimal calories will deposit fat. Now look, in the U.S. it would be hard to imagine a child developing kwashiorkor, but clearly there are kids in the United States that uh, are disadvantaged enough that they're not going to be exposed to high enough protein in either quality or quantity. Do you think that this, that there's to a lesser extent, some of this problem that's going to happen in, in developed nations like the U S I think it's possible. Um, frankly, these are the kinds of things I worry about with the advocates of plant-based diets. Uh, 
you know, we're starting to see New York City taking uh, animal proteins out of school lunch. Um, I mean, what is that really going to do? We're, we're conducting a public health experiment without actually having any knowledge of that. Uh, I think that's frightening. And the, the issue is public school lunches, uh, nursing homes, daycares, these are all under these federal guidelines where we're diluting out the quantity and quality of protein at the same time with no knowledge of what that's really going to mean. So I think that's, you know, I think that's pretty frightening to be doing that kind of public health experiment without knowledge of it. Yeah, I hadn't even considered it through that lens, actually. Um, let's talk about something else that we alluded to briefly, but now I want to get back to, which is... Um, maximum protein uh, usability or assimilation in a given sitting. So um, I'll, I'll tell you where I come at this. So, so one of the challenges that I've observed in taking care of patients is when they get into a very heavy regimen of time-restricted feeding. So you're probably aware of this, Don, but you know there are ideas that say, look, if you can just limit the amount of time that you eat, but not place any limits on what you eat or how much you eat or what you're eating from um, into this sort of intermittent fasting window, uh, it produces some health benefits. And uh, it's certainly an effective way to reduce calories. So if the goal of the exercise is to reduce total energy expenditure and you create a narrow enough window, you will indeed do that. But what we've seen repeatedly is people who, after say six months of adopting a very narrow feeding window, say one meal a day, will lose weight, but disproportionately will lose lean tissue. And um, so, so the the diagnosis here is pretty straightforward, right? They they clearly reduced energy intake, but they probably reduced protein intake too much, and so body composition actually got worse, despite the fact that weight went down. Which then gets to a point, which is, well, can't you just eat all of your protein in one meal? So if a person says, I'm just going to eat one meal a day, and let's just say this is a very active person, right? So they're going to eat 3,000 calories in one sitting, which I will raise my hand to saying I can do that quite easily. I'm quite a glutton. <laughs> um, even if I was able to eat 150 grams of protein in one sitting, is it clear that my body will get the benefit from that that it would if I ate 50 grams three times a day? Yeah, it's quite clear that you won't get a benefit, you know, that there is a limit. Um, so, so now we need to think about the body as muscle versus everything else. Um, so, so we're going back to the muscle-centric view that I like. Yeah, yeah. You're probably sensing a theme with me at this point. <laughs> the... Uh, the muscle, there's a lot of data now that muscle can handle protein meals for an optimum anabolic response between about 25 and maybe 60 grams, mm. okay? So then you start getting into distribution. If you think you're, if you're gonna have 150 grams per day, how should you distribute it? Um, what, one of my pet peeves in nutrition, uh, I'm, slightly getting off track here, is people refer to protein as a percentage of calories. Mm. Protein is not a percentage of calories. Protein is an absolute number. You need to decide on what you're going to build your diet around. So right now we're building it on 150. Uh, the, the, the issue with protein is being an absolute number, if your calories go down, say you're now a 75-year-old woman and your calories per day is now uh, uh, 1200 calories, you still have a hundred gram per day protein requirement. So now your protein needs are 35 to 40 percent of your calories. Uh, if people are doing weight loss, it's an absolute number. So people should never talk about percentage of calories. Uh, that's that's basically people who don't think protein is important and say, well, fat should be 30 percent, carbohydrates should be 50 percent, and that leaves 15 percent. I mean, you don't. You have to think about protein first. So, so that was the issue. Um, as far as distribution, uh, from my research, one of the things that we believe is that the most critical meal of the day is the first meal of the day. 
when you have had an overnight fast, mm -hmm. your protein synthesis is down and that mTOR signal molecule is down regulated, it's inhibited. And until you have enough leucine, around three grams, which translates to about 30 grams of protein, for most people, until you have a, a meal that has 30 or more grams of protein, your muscle stays catabolic. So you're continually breaking down protein. We think that's a significant aspect of aging, that people have lower and lower protein, they don't eat protein at breakfast, and that and we know the efficiency is going down in the first place, so we want to front load protein in the day. So we want at least two meals that are well above 30 grams of protein. So I always have people shooting for 40, 45 at the first meal, another 45, 45 at their last meal. And then in between, um, you know, again, if we're, if we're talking with people who are, um, let's say an elderly woman trying to maintain minimal muscle, I'll concentrate on those two meals. If I'm talking with somebody who's trying to do weight loss, I'll concentrate on three because I don't want them getting hungry. If I'm talking with someone who's trying to be hypertrophy, a muscle builder, I'll concentrate on four. So how many meals per day do I make anabolic and muscle? And by anabolic, I'm thinking 35 grams or more. And the data that we know for absolute certain is the first and last meal are absolutely important. The middle meal, I'd be hard pressed to tell, show you a single study that where anybody's ever show, looked at lunch. <laughs> and so the reason that you're saying for the anabolic person we need four meals is we just simply need we know it we know we need it for positive nitrogen balance. We're just going to have to get the MF. Yeah. Right. So there's two there's two aspects. There's one is mTOR signaling, muscle protein synthesis, leucine effects, and the other is total protein per day. So those two lead say well. If I need more protein and I max out at 50 grams, I need another meal. <laughs> and what about timing? Um, so let's just talk about someone who's doing their strength training in the morning. So let's say someone's going to do strength training from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Do you want them having that first bolus of protein before the workout? There's some debate about that. Um, you'll find some people and trainers who believe that. We did some studies and most of them were with animals where we looked at different timing. And we find that exhaustive exercise is catabolic no matter what. So having protein ahead of it doesn't make it. So we, we find the benefit is after the exercise when the system is now finely tuned, we've stimulated red one, actually we've inhibited red one, the system mTOR is ready to go. So we find the benefit is after exercise, not before. And just to be clear, what you're saying is, look, you can take all those amino acids before, but it's not going to prevent you from becoming catabolic during exercise. Because yeah. again, exhaustive exercise is a catabolic activity. So you are going to be breaking yeah. down muscle no matter yeah. how many amino acids are on board while lifting. It's more important yeah. after the lift that you have a good meal. You'll find some disagreement in that in the literature, but I strongly believe that what you just said is correct. And my research supports that. And talk about the efficiency or the window in time post a workout in which you want to make sure you're getting that first big meal of protein. Is it one of those things? We, 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 I'll tell you a funny story. So my, my youngest son, who's now five, but when he was like three, I mean, I don't know, for whatever reason, he just fixated on protein, probably because we kept telling him to eat this and eat that because there was protein in it. Hey, eat your salmon. It's got protein. Eat this because it's got protein. And basically, he has become the protein police of the preschool. So he just he <laughs> walks around and he looks at kids snacks and he's like, that doesn't have protein. That granola bar does not have protein. That has protein. And you can imagine what these people who work at the preschool say to my wife when she drops him off and picks him up. She's like, uh, are you a nutritionist? And she says, no. Oh, okay. It's just, you know, your, your son really fixates on everybody's protein consumption. Yeah. Um, so we joke about how he's going to be like that 
like one of those bro protein guys who's just going to be all obsessed with his protein and when he's eating it and stuff like that. So I've lost our train of thought here for a minute, but just to focus on the children for a moment. <clears throat> so we're talking about <clears throat> adult protein needs, and I don't want everybody to walk away thinking, gee, I need to get 50 grams of protein in my kid. Yeah. Um, children children will be very efficient at maintaining growth with small snacks of you know eight to ten grams of protein where that will have virtually no impact for an older adult so you know a a protein bar that had um, 10 grams of protein is a perfectly legitimate snack for a child where essentially the only thing it would do is probably increase liver enzymes in a 70 year old so don't want all the mothers think that they're doing a bad thing by giving their child a 10 gram protein snack. <laughs> okay, I want to go into, I remember what we were going to come back to, so I'll take us back there, <laughs> okay. but let, let's talk about that a bit more. So, because um, that's actually news to me. I didn't realize that there was minimal benefit in smaller quantities of protein. So this is another argument for don't dribble out your protein. Commit to so, it. It's binary. So, you eat yeah. it when you eat it, and so, then you don't when you don't. Yeah. So again, children versus adults. In, adults, in the yeah, adult, yeah. if 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 we have if we have uh, every meal of the day, uh, let's say we have a hundred grams of protein, but we take it in in very small meals, fifteen grams yeah. trickled in all day long. You will never stimulate muscle protein synthesis, but your liver will be perfectly fine. Your gut will respond to that amount of protein. Your gut, your liver, your heart, your kidney. All of those organs will respond to the, no, the net protein per day no matter when you ate it. But muscle doesn't. Muscle is specific. Uh, muscle is such an energy, to, as you mentioned earlier, there's so much mass to muscle. Muscle isn't triggered unless the diet is exactly right. And we could get into teleological arguments about leucine at this point, branch chain amino acid. Why does the muscle sense that? But basically, the muscle senses energy, insulin, protein before it triggers. And if all of those aren't balanced, it won't trigger, but your liver will. Yeah. I mean, I guess to your point, teleologically, you might make the case that the liver has more concern for the brain than the skeletal muscle. And, and maybe it gets priority over being happy because yeah. it has to maintain glucose yeah. homeostasis. And without glucose homeostasis, yeah. the brain would literally die within yeah. you know 20 minutes. So yeah. Yeah, I guess. Likewise, you know, your liver, your heart, those have to function, you know, middle of the night, your liver still has to be making protein, yeah. but your muscle doesn't. While you're laying there in bed, yeah. your muscle is catabolic and it's supplying amino acids so all those other organs work. Yeah. So while I argue about muscle-centric health, the reality is moment to moment, it's organ-based. Yeah. But long-term, you're overall health is determined on keeping the muscle healthy because it keeps everything else healthy. And just because I want to keep talking about this before we go back to where we were before I distracted us, um, is the reason that it's okay for kids to be, you know, eating little bit, much smaller amounts of protein, is it simply just the mass that, you know, like, I, I mean, my youngest weighs sure. uh, 25 kilograms. So is right. it basically just saying, look, he probably doesn't need more than 40 grams of protein a day. So for him to have a 10 gram serving right. is 25% of his protein. That's, that's like me having 40 grams. And plus his protein synthesis, as we mentioned earlier, is driven by hormones, yeah. where yours isn't. So Good point. His, growth, his growth is highly efficient. Uh, it's driven by hormones and he, he'll, he'll accommodate it in small doses. And, and you're right. He, probably only needs 45 for the day anyway. Okay. So I'll take you back to where we were before I sidetracked us. It was now asking about how big a window you have oh, to yeah. refeed right. to maximize muscle growth. So, so we actually did that first experiment in rats. So Josh Anthony and Tracy Anthony were in my lab uh, that was just before Lane came. Uh, and what we were looking at was exhaustive exercise, again in rodents. We were looking at this catabolic state. We were trying to look at how to muscle regulated recovery. And so we were looking at what were called initiation factors. And we discovered the link between leucine and an initiation factor called EIF4. 
And that is sort of the downstream effect of mTOR. mTOR is a regulator and it stimulates EIF4 and S6 and other initiation factors. And so what we found was that when you came out of an exhaustive exercise, muscle is catabolic until you took in enough leucine to reverse it. And so we started looking at feeding right after mm -hmm. exercise. And Stu Phillips and a number, you know, Doug Patton Jones and Luke Van, a lot of people sort of picked up on that. Um, okay, so now the caveats. Um, the biggest effect of feeding right afterwards is about a two hour window, but that's in untrained individuals. Um, if you begin to look longer, you can have a bout of resistance exercise and you'll detect the difference. You'll begin to make them, you'll start regulating that red one protein factor and you'll see an anabolic effect the next day, 24 hours, 36 hours later. So when does your protein effect? Well, it makes it more effective all the time. Um, the more trained you get, the less you're gonna see a post-exercise effect. So if you're beginning training, you're in the first four weeks, post-exercise protein probably makes sense. Mm. If you're well-trained, you're basically training the same way and you've been doing it for six months, I don't see any effect difference between having protein within two hours after exercise versus just having your three or four meals per day. You won't see any difference in either mass or strength. Yeah, I remember having this discussion with Lane as well and, and being very surprised by that, right? Being but pleasantly surprised, by the way, because it says, hey, look, once you get to a point where you're well-trained enough, you don't have to be so maniacal about meal timing. You can just focus exactly. on the big picture, which is total protein, protein quality, and spreading it out such that you don't exceed the metabolizable fraction of it at any one sitting. Right, exactly. And people, you'll hear trainers take that last statement, metabolizable energy, and you'll hear trainers say, well, you can't use more than 30 grams at a meal. You won't digest it or whatever. That's not true. I mean, you'll digest and absorb 100 grams of protein at a meal, but muscle in particular only has a window of around 20, 25 to 60, depending on protein quality, where it can use it. The liver will use all of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah. We have what is known as first pass metabolism of protein, which confuses the issue even more. When you eat a meal of protein, approximately 50% of the protein is, 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 is degraded to nitrogen and carbon before it ever gets to the blood, almost 50%. The one exceptions, the exception to that are the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine, and over almost 75, 80% of those get into the blood. And we're back to that teleological argument. Why did muscle learn to sense that? Because that basically shows up in the blood in direct proportion to the meal. And the muscle learned to sense that as a meal quality. It says, oh wow, this meal has adequate quality for me to, to trigger this very expensive process of protein synthesis, protein turnover. And until it sees that signal, it won't do it. While we're on the topic of muscle, Don, another thing I've learned somewhat recently that surprised me um, was the importance of leucine in um, fatty acid oxidation by the muscle. So, you know, one of the things that is such an important pillar of our practice is um, kind of low end aerobic training. We call it zone two. So, zone two mitochondrial efficiency. So, this is basically pushing your muscles to the maximum point at which you can keep lactate below two millimole. And in a very fit okay. individual, that you can generate a lot of power while still keeping lactate yeah. below two millimole. I mean, the, the best in the world can produce more than four watts per kilo while still keeping lactate below two millimole. And they're doing so virtually exclusively with fatty acid. So we will pair this type of analysis with CPET testing, and we will look at fat oxidation rates. And again, you will see the fittest of the fit have insanely high fat oxidation rates. They're over a gram or you know, roughly a gram per minute. Um, so tell me, uh, so, so another point of that is, look, the, a really good muscle doesn't just rely on glucose. A really good muscle can oxidize fats very effectively. 
What role does leucine play in that? That's a great question. And I don't think it's been researched well enough, but uh, there's no question. <clears throat> so leucine, I, I mentioned earlier, we were talking about amino acids and every amino acid has a different side chain. Well, leucine is one that's referred to as a branch chain amino acid, and its side chain is purely carbons. It's a carbon chain that looks a lot like a fatty acid. And so leucine is one of really two amino acids that are ketogenic. It is metabolized as a fatty acid. And what we know is that leucine will also activate the CPT1 enzyme, the carnitine palmitin transferase enzyme, which is the link of bringing fatty acids into the mitochondria for oxidation. So there's a benefit there. Um, it gets a, even more complicated in that when <clears throat> you have higher leucine, it also begins to inhibit pyruvate from going into the uh, into the mitochondria. So when you oxidize a leucine, the nitrogen that comes off of it is put onto pyruvate, generating an alanine. And so the body begins to recycle glucose. So it becomes kind of steady state on glucose and emphasizes fat oxidation. So back when you were talking about Schulman studies early, if you overload all of that, Basically, you can make the leucine inhibit carbohydrate oxidation. So if you have huge amounts of carbs coming in and then you overload the system with leucine, you'll inhibit pyruvate oxidation. And so that could look like insulin resistance. But if you look at the physiology of how it's supposed to work under conditions where you'd be burning fat like you just described, leucine actually stimulates fat oxidation and spares glucose for the brain and other tissues. So again, you really have to think about how the experiment's set up and what it's put, you know, what, what's getting inhibited and what's getting pushed. Now you've recently um, actually taken an interest in weight loss, right? So the dietary interventions that can be efficacious for, for weight loss and, and treating things like metabolic syndrome. So let's yeah. build off this idea a little bit, but how do you incorporate um, the strategy around reducing energy intake, right? Because this is sort of how I think about weight yeah. loss, right? Like you got to reduce the intake, but I think of right. three broad ways that you can approach that. So three strategies, right? One is you just reduce calories and that becomes the only focus. So you, you, you pay attention to the total energy content of food without thinking about the timing of food or the macro distribution of food. The next approach is you spend less time thinking about the total number of calories, spend more time thinking about the macronutrients, create, I, I describe it as sort of create a boogeyman in the diet, some things that you avoid and the yeah. restriction of certain things becomes a roundabout way to restrict total energy. And then we talked about time restriction as well as another strategy. Um, so if, how, how, do you, how do you think about manipulating that middle bucket of yeah. you know, changing macros to achieve yeah. energy deficit? So I totally agree. Weight management is a calorie issue. And it's not the same for every individual. Everybody's got a little different efficiency. So you know, we understand it's not, you can't be an accountant and expect to just count calories all the time. But um, let me build it as a story of how we thought about it. Uh, back in the late 90s, uh, the keto, you know, Atkins and the keto diet were out there and Barry Sears and uh, protein, you know, the zone diet and Mike Leeds and the protein power. And I was looking at all of those things and we were doing those leucine experiments and we had discovered this effect of leucine on muscle protein turnover and some of these metabolic things with you know fat metabolism and i basically took the leap of faith and said you know i think the underpinning of all of these diets is really the protein carb ratio and how can we manipulate that and so i started thinking well you know if we're going to create diets one we know that from a satiety standpoint protein is probably the most satiating you know, lowers fat would be next, carbohydrate the least. Uh, we were concerned about big insulin swings, so we wanted to sort of balance out our carbs per meal. We know that if people are overweight, they tend to have big uh, 
post-meal carbohydrate and insulin swings where they get two hours later, they'll have insulin low, uh, carbohydrate lows. And so we started trying to think about that and we said, okay, so we think the first meal after an overnight fast is critical. So we're gonna correct that. So we basically started saying, how much protein do you need? 30, 40 grams of protein uh, to get both satiety, protein synthesis effects. Um, we knew that protein had a higher thermogenic effect, burns more calories, more heat than either carb or fat. So we wanted to front load that effect. People have argued that, well, that's because protein of the nitrogen, it's harder to digest and absorb. We don't think that's true at all. We think the thermogenic effect is stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Mm. We know that that is a massive ATP expenditure. And so what we wanna do is maximize that at every meal. So our first meal, we wanted to be 40 grams of protein. We wanted to have a carb level that would not overstimulate insulin. So we kept that under around 30 grams for what we created a carbohydrate threshold concept uh, we can go into. And then fat sort of to round out the calories. And we basically developed three meals a day to distribute like that. Uh, we basically increased the protein to about 1.6 grams per kg. And we ran the study comparing it to the food guide pyramid with 0.8. So as far as we could tell, we did three different studies. One, a total feeding study where we fed everyone. A second study with diet and exercise that was four months. And a third study was multi-centered with 120 subjects that lasted 16 months. And so we did three studies. The, the, and the last, saw, the last two were free living where they were, total, they were, total, they were responsible well, for the food. But the first one they were fed? The first one we fed them in the lab so we knew exactly what they were eating. Yep. The second one, we actually fed them for their first two weeks for a few meals so they really saw what it would look yep. like. And the last one was totally free living based on the diets and manuals that we developed. And, and each of these was two arms where the only difference was the protein? So in the first one, it was two arms, uh, food guide pyramid, high carb, low protein versus higher protein, low carb. The second one was two by two. So we basically had the diet treatment and then we had a resistance exercise treatment. Mm -hmm. So high protein, low exercise, high yep. protein, high, et cetera. And then the last one was diet uh, with a generic recommendation for exercise, but two by uh, just a two treatments. Effect. So what did the first experiment show, the really well-controlled one? Mm -hmm. So the, the well-controlled one, what we found was that with the higher protein, and as far as we could measure exactly the same calorie intake, the people on the higher protein, low carb, lost more total weight, more total fat, and less lean, and that stabilized their insulin and glycemic regulations and lowered their triglycerides across the board. And what, do you remember what the difference was in, in weight and um, fat mass? And, and, and was it all explained by so, the thermodynamics of the um, delt difference in protein? It was close. We, we found that based on, you know, if you just, if you assume that body fat is a, you know, 3,500 calories and you can make that calculation, <laughs> we, we found, we figured out that uh, the people on the higher protein diet uh, were getting a benefit of, a, I think it was around 170 calories a day eating the same calories. Yep. So that could be about a, the thermodynamic effect. And so in other words, that, that amount spread out over the duration of the study explained the difference in weight loss. Right. So both groups lost weight. They were both on weight loss diets, yep. but the pr protein people lost, uh, and I didn't look those numbers up, but they lost around eight pounds more and almost all of, you know, something like, you know, six and a half of it was fat. And did they also... Um complain less of hunger or was there a difference subjectively yeah. between the groups? Yeah, uh, we did We did a satiety uh, check in that, uh, really just a, uh, uh, 
using a, an analog scale. We just ask them to rate how they felt and stuff. And one of the things that the dietitians who were running the study always came back is they said that the, the protein people were never talking about food and snacks, but the people on the high carb diet were always talking about being hungry and snacking. And so, yeah, there's definitely a different satiety and compliance issue to it. And, and the, I we assume also, the fat was constant the longer, in that study. In the longer term studies, in the fr first study, which was only 12 weeks, basically all subjects in both groups finished the study. In the longer studies, we got into four months and longer, uh, we found much higher dropout rates in the high carb group too. So did the results of all three studies point in the same direction, which was exactly. a higher protein weight loss? So a protein sparing weight loss diet, which gets back to your point earlier, stop thinking about protein as a percent of total calories. Protein should always be absolute. And if you want to yeah. think about it that way, it's actually, it should, as, as you reduce calories, protein should increase the total fraction of calories. Um, right is going to preserve lean tissue better, maintain satiety better, and plus there's potentially this bonus of the thermogenic effect of protein. Right. It definitely partitions the weight loss toward fat, protects muscle, the lean tissue, definitely has higher satiety. Um, you know, and w one of the things we know, and in fact, for a long time, there was a lot of debate whether people over 60 should ever try practice weight loss because they would they lose, lose too, too much, much lean bass and they can't gain it back. Um, you know, Doug Patton Jones had the theory that uh, sarcopenic aging isn't a gradual decline, it's a series of acute effects that you injure yourself, you're in bed, you're, you have a surgery, whatever, you acutely lose lean mass and you can never gain it back. So we were concerned about that. We want, we want weight loss, but we don't want people to lose any lean mass, especially if they're adults. If you're a 20 year old, it probably doesn't matter so much, but if you're older, you know, if you're beyond 40, it does matter. It's a scary thought, Don, if you think about it, right? I mean, 40 is <laughs> yeah. not that old. And yet, yeah. um, you know, I, I recently had shoulder surgery. Uh, so as the time that we're recording this, I'm probably about five months out from that so shoulder surgery. And um, I, I still have not gained back all of the, the, the muscle mass. Yeah. Now, I think I will gain it back. Um, but I look at how difficult it has been yeah. and how acutely I lost it. I mean... Within three yeah. weeks, I was 10 pounds lighter. I lost 10 pounds yeah. of body weight. Yeah. And it's obviously not just from the shoulder. It's when you don't have an arm, you can't squat, you can't yeah. deadlift, you can't do all of these other things. So I, I would bet that, you know, obviously some of that was water weight, but look, I think seven yeah. of those 10 pounds was lean tissue that I lost in, in, a, in a span of three weeks. There's some tremendous research by my colleague, Doug Patton Jones, who unfortunately passed away this last year, um, who did a lot of that kind of bed rest sort of study and looking at older adults versus younger. And in the same period of time, an older adult in bed rest will lose four times as much muscle as a younger adult. It's, it's frightening how fast you can lose it. And you know, to your point, if you're diligent and do weight training, you can begin to gain it back, but it's hard to ever get back to ground zero if you lose it in aging. And people will ask me, well, all this loosing stuff, when does it really come into play? You know, is it as, it's not as important for a 20 year old as it is for a 60, but where's the middle ground? You know, where does it change? And I think it's a little like bone health. I think once you're once you're 40, you're sort of on the back end of that and you need to be much more careful. Doug and I ran a study, which you know everybody quotes now, where we took 90 grams of protein and looked at it distributed as three meals per day, 30, 30, 30, versus 10, 20, 60. Mm -hmm. uh, and we found that with the same amount of protein, the same overall diet, uh, you would have higher net protein synthesis with the distri distribution to breakfast. So that's kind of where all the distribution data came from was that study. and. Uh, we ran that study in 37 year olds. The average age was 37. So we think that by mid 30s, you can detect the distribution effects. And just to be clear, Don, do you think that the reason 30, 30, 30 was better than 10, 20, 60 because you started the day at 30 
or because you had three meals where you cleared the hepatic threshold? That's a great question and one that I wish the Twitter world would understand. I think the effect is moving at the breakfast, the first meal. I think that, frankly, we'd have been better you off if we ran this. You should have done it 60 10 as the other arm, right? That would be the no. I think it should. I think it should have been. I think it should have been forty. What's the math? Forty ten forty. I think the first and last meals mm -hmm. are the key. Okay. The and and I'll give you the reason for that. We've done a number of studies in animals. Uh, other people, Mike Rennie and and uh, Phil Atherton have done it in humans. But when you trigger mTOR at that first meal, we know that it's still stimulated five hours later. Mm -hmm. So why do you need leucine for mTOR at lunch if it's still stimulated? You don't. So there's nobody has actually studied that at this unless, point. Unless you're the person who just is so big, you know, like you're lame, right? Like if you're lame and you're, right. you weigh 200 pounds and you're a bodybuilder. But, he, but the key to what you just said is now you're talking total protein per day, right. not a leucine effect. Yeah, yes, exactly. It's, no, it's not a leucine mTOR effect. That's right. It's There's total not this substrate. threshold it's total to it. Substrate. Yeah. It's, it's okay, Lane needs 250 grams of protein per day. He'd be better off putting that in four or five meals yeah. than putting it in two. Yeah. So that's the difference that people need to understand is that distributing across all the meals, if it's for weight loss and appetite, that's great, but it's not an mTOR effect. So Don, this kind of brings me to, to sort of, uh, you know, something we've talked about before, which is, you know, so much of this research that you've done has been funded by industry. And a lot of people are going to say, well, we're going to discount everything Don just said because you know so 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 give us the names of some of the organizations that have have funded your work over the last four decades so so let me backdrop that for you um so i had the leucine concept that leucine was going to be key to protein synthesis and muscle we ran a study in the early 80s where we realized it was initiation effect and so we then started to realize we started looking for what those initiation factors were going to be, and it's EIF4. So we sent that as a proposal to NIH, National Institute of Health, for 10 years. And basically, it was continuously turned down. And they said, well, we only study disease, and we don't know of any deficiencies of protein, so it's not a priority to us. And so basically, I was left with what turned out to be a revolutionary idea of reinventing protein that NIH wouldn't fund. And basically, I finally went to Kraft Foods, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the National Dairy Association, uh, the American Egg Board, uh, and uh, some of the other groups who were inherently interested in protein and they fund, and we had some from the USDA. From I, I was at a land grant university, so those were the funding sources that basically unlocked all of this knowledge about protein uh, for adults, leucine, mTOR, uh, muscle centric health. All of that was unlocked simply because we could get funding from Kraft and Beef. And you know, am I biased? Well, you know, everybody who eats is biased in some way. And, you know, if you if you look at research, and I think maybe Lane said this with you, I never believe research when I read it until I see it in three more labs. So I don't mind if people look at my research and say, I don't believe it. But my research has been out there, very clear theories for 20 years now, and every test makes it stronger. And so that's how you believe it. The fact that Kraft or Beef funded it's irrelevant. The issue is everybody who's ever run the study after me shows the exactly same thing. And do you think NIH has, or have you seen? I know you've been, you know, semi-retired now. You're kind of not really retired, but you're 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 <laughs> retired from the grant cycle. Um, exactly. But, but do you have colleagues that are still in it, or do you see any evidence that NIH has taken a broader purview? to health, uh, if nothing else, they should be able to look at the fact that two thirds of Americans are, you know, have metabolic syndrome. Yeah. And that should at least give pause to think we might need to revisit the way we're approaching yeah. nutrition. 
and and therefore maybe yeah. we should be funding quote unquote non diseased research in nutrition. I, I think they definitely have. Um, Chris Lynch, who's director of nutrition at NIH now, uh, that position didn't even exist. And where, is that within NIDDK? In, where does that sit? That's a great question. I think it's across multiple institutes. Okay. So which one actually funds the most? I think NIDDK might be mm -hmm. the one. Um, the Cancer Institute. I I think it. I think his unit actually brought, goes across multiple okay. uh, institutes. But again, that didn't exist back in the late '80s, early '90s. Um, so. You know, I think it may be a little broader, but there is a general philosophy still at NIH that uh, NIH does not do applied food research, that industry should fund it. So that becomes a catch-22. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, if we're going to study the difference between whey and soy, unless you can say, well, that's going to cure heart disease, they're not going to fund it. Um, and so you have to then go to the Dairy Council and say, I want to do this study. And then people say, well, you were funded by the Dairy Council, or I go to the Soy Board or whatever. Um, so it's a catch-22, but basically the alternative is we put our head in the sand and we don't do the research. So basically, I look at people in nutrition right now, um, and literally, I don't know anybody in nutrition who doesn't get industry funding. It's just simply how you have to get funded. Yeah. One of the things I would also point out in this whole issue of bias, it's important to recognize that the animal commodities are all under the USDA supervision because they are uh, animal commodities and they they have checkoff boards. So that means everything they say in advertising has to be screened where the grain industry has big companies like Kellogg's and Pillsbury and Coke and Pepsi, and they can literally go out and say anything they want. And so you'll see a product out there that pretends to be uh, an egg, and they'll claim that there's better than eggs, but egg can't come back and, and refute it. They can't say, so you've got two different playing fields one that's highly restricted and, and supervised, and the other which is fair game, you know, for, you know, First Amendment, I can say anything I want. <laughs> On that topic, Don, wh how closely have you paid attention to kind of uh, both the plant-based meat and the synthetic meats? I've, I've, I've paid a little bit of attention because obviously there's two companies that are uh, pretty yeah. popular. I can never remember their names. I think it's Beyond Meat and Impossible Meat or something like that. Exactly. And the, Got it. And, and they're plant-based meats, right? So they're making right. meat out of plant. And then you have a whole host of companies, none of whom I can remember the names of, that are actually trying to make synthetic meat. Um, yeah. The little bit that I've read about that, which really amounts to reading like two scientific articles, uh, yeah. left me with the impression that that will not be technically feasible. Um, that That just from an energetics, cost, mass balance, um, right. sanitation, GMP standpoint, that's not going to happen. Right. So it's um, yeah. uh, that, that's my way of saying either I'll be proven wrong or that will turn out to be one of the biggest boondoggles um, of yeah. industry in some time. Um, do, do you have thoughts on either of those two, uh, including kind of nutritional composition and, and how it feeds into yeah. an amino acid perspective? First is an overview. I think that as the world continues to expand in population, we're probably going to need additional protein sources. Um, we may be near our capacity for animal-based proteins. I mean, we may not be able, you know, I, I don't think we can double it again. So mm -hmm. we may be near. So we're going to need other sources. So, you know, I, I accept that plant-based proteins are important to us. Uh, I totally agree with your comment about synthetic proteins. I don't think that will ever be economically or environmentally feasible. I don't think that's true. Uh, then we get into sort of the the, the popular versions of plant-based, you know, Beyond Burgers and things like that. And the reality is, it looks like a flash in the pan. I mean, people tried it, uh, and basically, if you go to a Burger King and look, basically 
they had a good sales for a few months and basically, and you tracked that, it was all people who don't normally go to Burger King. It was people who were interested in a plant-based burger. They went and tried it once and never came back. <laughs> um, so basically we know the stock has fallen through the bottom now. We know that nobody's using it. Um, the problem with it is, um, let's take Beyond, uh, you know, Beyond Burger. Uh, basically it's a pea protein that's produced in Canada it's shipped to in China because we can't process it in the United States. There's no processing for the most part. They're beginning to develop it, but when it came out, there was none. Shipped to China. China processes protein, ships us back to the US. Uh, we know transportation is the number one cause of greenhouse gas in the world. Uh, and so now we've shipped it all over the country. Comes back to the US and they process it into something uh, with like 25 ingredients probably five or six of them are not FDA approved. Uh, what, what, and so what, now I was, you I have- I wasn't aware of that. What, why, why, why so they many? They have multiple products. They have multiple components in synthetics that have never really been studied and they're not FDA approved. So they're basically relying on safety uh, without ever proving it. Uh, you know, will that ever come back to haunt them? I don't know. But you know, in the, in the spirit of having natural foods, they're certainly not anything natural about them. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I think that plant-based proteins have been around a long time. Um, I think trying to pretend that it's meat uh, or you know, calling, calling uh, soy drink milk or almond drink milk, I think those are travesties. I think those are standards of identity. Uh, almond milk has uh, what, one gram of protein per eight ounces, where cow's milk has eight, calling that milk is, is pure deception. Um, <laughs> you know, my wife, my, my lost... wife uh, I love cashew milk, by the way. That's how I make all my smoothies sure. and stuff. My wife calls it nut juice. She's like, I do too. You're going to have some I mean, of your exactly... nut juice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I, you know, I'm not against using them, but right. I think, you just the, think consumer the nomenclature should... needs to be correct. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, one of the examples I like to use is that if you look at a wheat cereal, won't pick any, but take a wheat cereal that has four grams of protein per serving. We always said that's only two probably. On the label, it says you mix it with uh, three fourths of a cup of milk. So now we have 10 grams. And if you look at the lysine balance of that, it's exactly balanced. But if you go to soy milk, a, uh, soy milk only has six grams per uh, eight ounce per cup instead of eight. So now you already have less protein and it's also deficient in lysine. So it takes almost a quart of milk, hmm. it takes almost 30 ounces of milk to balance that cereal. So if you're a mother feeding this to your child and thinking, well, I'm doing a plant-based thing and I'm feeding them a totally deficient diet with, uh, you know, six ounces of soy milk for breakfast, I'm feeding them a totally deficient science diet. How many mothers know that? Yeah, yeah I, I, look, if I don't know that, I'm guessing a lot of mothers don't know that. <laughs> and so those are the kinds of things that we think need to come out about protein quality. We want a system where we can show people an additive value and that at the end of it, and I put that meal together, and this, this is a company called WiseCode that I'm working with. Uh, we think that we can show with using QR codes and your phone will simply add them up and you can tell what your total meal looks like. Yeah, that would be incredibly helpful. Uh, I mean, I, I, again, as I alluded to earlier, still something I, trouble, uh, I have trouble with is, um, is, is doing it, especially on days when I don't have access to as much meat. And uh, what it comes down to for me is yeah. just how much did I have from leftovers the night before? So, you know, I've yeah. got a meat based meal, which is my dinner. Uh, you know, wild game is sort of our, our routine, uh -huh. right? So elk and venison and stuff like that. And if I'm smart enough and thoughtful enough to make a lot extra, then I get, I can basically have it for breakfast and lunch the next day, yeah. but sometimes I'm not. Yeah. And then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making protein shakes. I'm, I'm, you know, eating a venison yeah. bar here and there, but it gets a lot harder. And yeah. yeah, I've never even, I'm having a hard enough time just making sure I hit the total grams per day of protein. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's no attention on my end going into, Hey, how much methionine is here? How much leucine is here? How much sure. lysine is here? 
Um, and if, uh, you know, as I said a while ago, if, if you've got 125 grams of protein in your diet per day, chances are you'll hit those numbers. Yeah. Uh, and where, where leucine is a meal-to-meal -meal number, lysine is a daily number. It doesn't matter meal-to-meal. -meal. Mm -hmm. It's a total. And, and I guess for me, that's probably okay. But then I think about it for my wife or my, my female patients sure. where it, I mean, right. it's, like, it's hard to get them up to 120 grams per day. Yeah. We struggled with all of the adult women we had in our studies. And, you know, we had whatever, three, 400 uh, it's a real struggle to keep a female at 100 grams of protein per day. It's just a struggle. Uh, and that then quality becomes an issue. And you know, that's my, my concern with the whole plant-based movement is that do people have the resources to make that, you know, can you make that healthy? Sure you can, but you A, need a lot of knowledge, you need a lot of food skills, and you're gonna have to eat synthetic products because you can't get it from eating, you know, be, you know, lentils and rice. You just can't eat enough of them. And so you're gonna have to have shakes or supplements or something to get to that kind of level. Otherwise, the, the track record says that vegetarians will end up around somewhere in the 60s for their protein per day. And quality does make a difference at that level. Well, Don, this has been really interesting. I'm, I'm so glad that we were introduced. And um, uh, I can talk about protein all day because it's an eternal interest of mine personally, but also in terms of helping as many of my patients as I can. I think this is uh, perhaps the, you know, it's not the macronutrient that gets the most debated on Twitter. That's reserved for carbs and fat. But this is, this is the one that I think we need to be paying more attention to. So uh, I'm grateful for the work you've done and for... Uh, the attention you've brought to it today in our discussion. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to do that. And I, you know, I maybe one th thought I'd leave you with that we haven't touched on is people talk about high protein. Uh, and I think it's important to try and come to grips with what that means. Mm -hmm. If you look at all of the epidemiology, which I think is pretty bad science, the definition of high protein is about 1.2 grams per kg and low protein is actually below 0.8. And so a lot of them will express it as percentage of calories and they'll say less than 10%. And so when you look at the epidemiology, you, you need to realize they're talking about very narrow ranges of protein intake. Uh, and, and it really isn't the protein that's making a difference. It's the calories and the other things that are going with it. And I'll just, one last thought, when I was, for four years, I was director of research for the American Egg Board. So I funded all of the research that basically got the cholesterol uh, direction eliminated from our guidelines. Uh, one of the things we funded though, was there was a lot of research suggesting that eggs had a high correlation with obesity and diabetes and heart disease. And so we funded some research with, with uh, uh, Teresa Nichols and Vic Vergoni, who are experts in the NHANES data. And what they looked at was that in the epidemiology, the difference between the first quartile and the last quartile for egg consumption was three to three and a half. So they were basically saying that a half an egg per week, or per week, yeah, per day, uh, I'm sorry, per week, half an egg per week was the difference in causing obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. And so what they did was they went into the NHANES data and they factored out all of the eggs that were eaten at fast food versus the eggs that were just eaten at home in a quote, good nutrition setting. And what they found is in every case, eggs now became a positive. They reduced obesity, they reduced. So basically it's not the egg, it's the egg in the company it keeps. And you can make anything a bad diet. Yeah, and I think to your point, it's when we talk about epidemiology pointing at high protein being uh, a problem, you realize anybody who's tried to actually consume high protein realizes it ain't high protein. It's high calorie yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. And the protein exactly. is along for the ride because again, 1.2 yeah. uh, grams per kilo is actually kind of low protein in the context yeah. of a high calorie diet. If you do... If you look at epidemiology and you do any food surveys, what you realize right away is that 
the data for protein is pretty good. If I ask you how many eggs you ate yesterday, you'd give me the number. If I ask you how many ounces of milk or how many grams of, of meat, you'd give, because we sell those by ounces and weights. But if I ask most people how many carbs they ate yesterday, they'd miss it by 200 grams. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the problem with epidemiology is that the errors are, are not they're, homogeneous. They're not they're not equal. So anyway, I ramble on, but a great pleasure to chat with you, Peter. Thank you, Don. This was fantastic.